Well, let me tell you why I like Christmas. I like Christmas because you get stuff. No, that's not why I like Christmas. I, <laughs> but, you know, it starts out that way, right? You start out liking Christmas because it's a party and you get stuff. And, and then but slowly and surely, Christmas changes as you get older from, from a season in which you receive stuff to receiving the, a season you've got to pull off. Anybody feeling that pressure already December 2nd? So, so the shift is I got to shift. It happens to me. That's what happens to the kid. To I got to make it happen as an adult. And I find out there's a lot of emotions around the holidays. And that if I don't center my emotions, if I don't center them on the hope found in Christ, then my emotions are just going to go all over the map at this time of the year. Gene and I will, will determine at what time we get into the Christmas spirit, and we'll, we'll, we'll announce it together when it, it hits, and, and it hits at different times. And, and there's been a few seasons that I'm not sure it hit at all, really. But what I found is that, that Christmas doesn't bring an emotion. It accentuates an emotion. So if I'm disappointed or discouraged or I'm fearful or I'm tired or I'm overwhelmed, Christmas comes, and then I feel all those in spades. And if I'm feeling good and joyful and hopeful and all that stuff, and then, then, well, then I feel that much more. And I think it's important, and I think actually it's why maybe if I could somewhat project back to the 5th century when this celebration of Advent gets initiated, that maybe, maybe we're not so different from the, from the 5th century. Maybe the same kind of pulls and tugs and the same need to be anchored into a living hope. And so here becomes this, this symbol This looking back and this looking forward. That in the past there was hope, and in the future there'll be hope. In the past there was experienced love, and in the future there'll be love. And there'll be joy and peace and then the light of Christ. So we light the candles of Advent to anchor us to Christians worldwide and Christians back to 5th century and beyond. But we light them at this time of the year to remember to be anchored in where our hope comes from. Our text this morning is one of my all-time favorite passages of Scripture. Um, If you've walked in this door, we call this the Main Street side of our our church. This is the Cracker Barrel side. You can figure it out. So so the Main Street side, normally there's a wall there that we kind of call the vision wall. So we have um, a little version of our Scripture, John 10, 9 and 10. For I'm the gate. I came that I have life and have it more abundantly or have it more than you ever dreamed of, the message says. And then we have um, the, the mini version of the mission statement, Fresh Starts, Great Friends, Real Purpose. But when you walk in an Advent season, you, hear, you see, for unto us a child is born, and then wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. And that's the passage of Scripture I want to unpack today uh, as we talk about freedom and hope found in a person. Here's the passage in, a, in its more blown out version, Isaiah 9, 1 through 7. Nevertheless, say nevertheless. All right, that's an important word we're going to get to. There will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. In the past, he humbled the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali. That would be other names for Israel. But in the future, he will honor Galilee of the nations, which was where Jesus grew up. By the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. I look forward to unpacking that. And then verse 6, that maybe is more familiar. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and the peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 1947, a Bedouin shepherd in the countryside, maybe it was out of boredom, picks up a rock and, 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 and there were some caves, some openings in uh, mountains uh, uh, around him. And he, he took one of these rocks and he, he threw it probably nonchalantly through this hole and he hears a crack. And when he hears a crack, he recognizes this as a, there was a, a, a pottery that had shattered. 
And under exploration from then and, and times, times further on from there, they discover what's known as the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, the Dead Sea Scrolls contained portions of Scripture from the Old and the New Testament. But ironically, or, or it's probably not ironic at all, right, but the entire text of the book of Isaiah was found in those caves. The entire text. Isaiah is known as the Messianic prophet. There is more Messianic prophecies in Isaiah, thousands of years before Christ, than any other book. In the New Testament, the Psalms is the only book quoted more than Isaiah. And I think, I think the why, why I bring up this biblical nerdy stuff to you today is to help you understand that this is not just, this is not just a, a, a fairy tale. It's not just written by a guy, a woman. It is the eternal word of God that he has maintained for us. And then even we would find, I just, it just makes me smile that the, the book of Old Testament prophecy tells the most of the coming Christ would be found in its entirety. You can trust the literary, the literary devices that's been given to us. But the word nevertheless is important because when you hear the word nevertheless, it's a second chance word. Nevertheless, breathes a sigh of relief when you hear someone say, nevertheless. It, it, puts, it puts wind back in your sails. Why? Because the word nevertheless says that regardless of what has happened in the past, it will not negate what I'm going to do in the future. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a recognition. I mean, it's a bold-faced recognition. It's not a sugarcoating. It's not overlooking. It's not throwing it on the rug. It is a very true recognition of what happened and what is happening here but it's saying that it does not have the power to negate what I'm going to do here. The word from Isaiah, Isaiah was a prophet. He uh, prophesied over the reigns of four kings. And in this passage, starting in chapter 7, begins his third king, and it's Ahaz. Now, Israel at the time found themselves in this political, this geopolitical kind of uh, what you might call between a rock and a hard place. Assyria is now the world's power. It is the world's power, and Jerusalem sits in its wake. It sits where Assyria has plotted a course, and it's going to come through, and it's going to wipe everybody out in its path, and Jerusalem now sits in its path. Two kings that would have been in between Assyria and Israel somehow come to the conclusion that if they can overtake Jerusalem, that p quite possibly that their might would surface and Assyria might avoid them seeing that they're so powerful. And so they lay siege to the city. And to lay siege to the city, they didn't breach the walls. They didn't have the ability to breach the walls. So basically it's a wait out game. It is an eliminate any ability for stuff to come in and come out. And that includes food, that can include provisions. So they laid siege to the city. And when God sends Isaiah to give a word to, to Ahaz, he does so when Ahaz is kind of surveying the water supply at the time. Okay? So it's been some time. He's concerned about what the water, how the water situation is in the city. And he goes up, but he's already kind of made a plan of how to get out of this mess when God sends Isaiah. And when God sends Isaiah, typically we would hear someone say, don't just sit there, do something. Isaiah tells Ahaz, don't just do something, sit there. The word is that the two nations come against you are just mirror images of themselves. The, 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 the exact wording was they're, they're smoldering stubs, uh, stumps of wood. They're, they're not a big tree. They're, they, they once were, but they're not now. You, you need to not be afraid of them, and you need to just sit still and trust me. And when I wrote that this week, and when I prayed over it last night, I couldn't help but believe that that word right there is, is for someone. Because, see, when, 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 you have, when, you, when you get in times where you don't have any hope, you just feel like you need to do something. But I believe the word of the Lord for some of the days, you don't need to panic. You need to stay put. But Ahaz had already made the move. Ahaz had already made a treaty with an enemy to fight for them against Assyria. Okay? You know, the, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. But what God knew is that that was going to be out of the frying pan and into the fire. But Ahaz, in his panic, had already made the treaty. Now, that's sobering. When the Lord, word of the Lord comes in, 
And basically, it's a word that says you've made the wrong choice. And then we get to chapter 9. And he begins chapter 9 with, nevertheless. Now you see why it's such a great word? You, you've, you've already made the wrong choice. But nevertheless, this is what I'm going to do. It's a, it's a redeeming word. Israel still had to walk through, they had to walk through some stuff. God's word nevertheless doesn't say, I'm going, to re, I'm going to remove all of that. I'm going to, I'm going to wipe all of that away. It's I'm going to redeem all of that. When we come to Christ, it's, 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 it's redemption. We're redeemed. Our past isn't erased. It's redeemed. It was dead, and it brought death. Now it's alive. It brings life. Nevertheless is a huge word. So I don't know where you've been. I'm more concerned about where you are. Are, are, you, are you on top somewhere assessing the water supply? And this morning, even this early in the message, the word of the Lord to you, to somebody in here, is don't just do something. Trust me. Stay put. A, 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 a phrase that I used to use back in student ministry. Then I nicky. Never doubt in the darkness of what God shows you in the light. We live in the darkness. God shines light in that darkness. So um, what does this nevertheless, the nevertheless introduces us to a promise, okay? The nevertheless introduces us to a promise. And so here becomes, here are the next verses that kind of get lost because we go to verse 6. Here are the things that, that he promises us with this nevertheless. First is, and we find in the back half of verse 1, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. No more gloom for those in distress. So the promise of God replaces gloom for hope. Inevitably, decisions, actions apart from God bring some measure of disappointment, disillusionment, hardship. But the promise is that that gloom is going to be replaced with hope. Okay. The second part of the, pr the promise is that he replaces light for darkness. So verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Darkness carries, it's, carries a mood darkness, right? It gets dark now, what, 2.30, right? So you, and, I, and, and I just referenced Nikki, so I referenced Daniel. I've known him about 25 years. He is a bear come mid-January, late January, February. He needs to be outside. He needs sunshine. You don't want to go near him, please. When he's hungry or when it's third. Darkness carries this. This mood, darkness also kind of carries lostness. You know, well, I'm, I was in the dark on that. Or, and you find even you can drive to a familiar place when it's dark outside and it's more difficult to find than it was during the daytime. All right, darkness carries those moods. But when Christ comes and when Christ came, it was a light. When you're in a dark place and someone, there's a light somewhere, you're drawn to the light. Not just your eyes. Inevitably, you get drawn to going towards the light. The light's going to represent freedom. It's going to represent a lot of things, right? So he's saying that I'm going to replace this darkness with the light of Christ, but not just light that we can see and maybe move towards, but when he goes to dawn and the light has dawned, I think about settling in. I think about making resonance. I, I, I've never understood, really, the fascination with sunrises. You know, people get up and they want to go see a sunrise, and, and uh, we were in Hawaii for our 25th wedding anniversary, and Gina wanted us to get up and drive on top of Heliakala or something, right? It's like where tourists go and you drive up to catch the sunrise. It was like, I don't know, minus 20 or something when you got up there. You know, what, and they came up and she said, isn't that beautiful? And I said, I've, I've seen that sunrise a lot, right? <laughs> Every day, east. And, you know, there it is. And I can check my phone and it's going to tell me within a minute or so when it's going to crest the horizon. But he's but in terms of Christ, I can settle in Christ. And quite frankly, there's a lot of things we can depend on in Christ, and there is a, there is a stability to Christ. But it's amazing to me how different he keeps showing up to me every day, though. Right? I mean, there, there is this consistency that you want in a relationship, this kind of go-to, never-changing consistency, and yet it's always changing. 
Yeah, he's always surprising. And, and that's the promise. The promise is that when, when Christ comes, there's going to be, he's going to replace darkness with light. It's a great promise. He goes on there and says that he replaces reduction for expansion. This one's a little interesting. I might not have worded that one the best, but, but, but hang with me. Verse 3 says, You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. Now, here's what's make this fascinating. I, fascinating. Isaiah, slow down, Charm. Isaiah is using a literary device that writes a future event in the past tense. And he's delivering this word to Ahaz that's about to enter battle, but he's writing it as if the battle's been done and won. It speaks of the eternality and the decisiveness and the dependability of the promise of God. That he can write something in the past tense that we haven't seen happen yet in the future. Paul says that we serve a God who calls things that are not as if they were. It's an amazing promise. Here is, uh, oh, so here I want, I want to illustrate, I want to illustrate this because it says the reduction with expansion. So here's how, here's how I want to do this. God always seemingly, and always, and not seeming is not the right word, um, does big things with small things. And he keeps doing big things for small things to demonstrate that he's the big thing. Because if he does big things with big things, then we think we're the big thing, right? But we don't change people. He does. So he continues to do big things through small things, right? So let me show you. Let me show you. Um, that's an inverted image of New Jersey. And I, if I had my laser pointer, I'd tell you where I grew up. Now, the image behind that, anyone recognize that landmass? It's Israel, and then that's Tennessee. And I put that up there because Israel is... 8,020 square miles, roughly the size of New Jersey, what, a fourth the size of Tennessee. Its most spoken and outspoken enemy is Iran. Okay? Iran says specifically, and I, if I could pronounce the Abinajab or whatever his name is, I, I'd pronounce it, we want to wipe Israel off the face of the earth. But since 1948, Israel's become its own nation. And it's been its nation, whether we, anybody recognize or not, way back, right? All right, here's the size of Iran. Iran is 636,400 square miles. 80 times the size of Israel. And yet, Israel still stands. Small, but nothing small. When God's word. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that, that Israel's perfect. What, what I'm saying is God's word, nevertheless, up, keeps applying to this. So regardless of what seems small, because Nazareth was small, Bethlehem was small, Galilee was small. Let me keep going. The promise replaces oppression for freedom. Oppression for freedom. Here's verse 4. For as in the day of Midian's defeat... You have shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar that crosses across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Here's why this is important. He's drawing their attention back to a time where Midian was coming against Israel and there was this no-name, nondescript military person that God wanted to put in control and his name was Gideon. And Gideon was, in, Gideon was insignificant from an insignificant tribe. He was insignificant. The, the force that he rallied to fight um, was a force of 10,000 going against 135,000. And God would not let him fight that battle with 10,000. He kept reducing the size of the army until he got it to 300. Okay, already at 10,000, I'm not up for the 135,000, right? But now at 300, why? Because Gideon wasn't the big thing. God was the big thing. All right, And so what, what seems to be oppressive, the most oppressive, the biggest thing you can't possibly get out of, work your way around of, resource yourself out of, no matter how large, how big, how daunting that is, God still does big things with small things. We, we, we eliminate, dismiss, disregard small things. And God takes small things to break the largest of oppressions. That's the promise. Here's the last one. Replaces opposition for assistance. 
Verse 5, every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. This one's always been tough for me to capture. It's, I, honestly, this week was the first time I really was able to wrap my brain completely around that. What he's saying is the, the people that's the, the great boots, David. So the, so the boots used in battle against me. The garments that you're wearing that were used in battle against me will be burned to provide fuel to keep me and my family warm. That's staggering. The very things that represented the oppression, the very things that represented their strength, when the promises of God are fulfilled, will be repurposed for my good. Staggering. Staggering the promises of God. How does he fulfill those promises? Those are some pretty, pretty big promises. If you promise to bring me lunch this week, I'm going to say, that's great. Thank you, because you all have the ability to bring me lunch. And if you want to know my office hours this week, just hit me up after service. But if one of you comes and promises me to drop off a vintage Porsche this week, I'm going to have a lot more questions. I'm going to want to know, is that possible? Do I need to get my hopes up? Do you really have a line on that? Are you really going to give that to me? What color is that? What year is that? What, I, you know, I'm, going to, I'm going to have a few more questions for you. So it makes sense that if you're going to make these big promises, we need to know who's making these big promises. What's the character of the person making these promises. And so he gets into, now we get into, for, uh, for unto us a child is born, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. Now here's, here's some theological stuff for you. It's not complicated, but it is theological, and it's important to understand it. He talks about a son, and he talks about a, a boy. For unto us a child, a child. That's, that's humanity. That, that is that the, the, the essence of God, all the deity of God gets, gets wrapped up into this child. He foregoes his glory. He comes. There, there is no other belief system, none in the history of time, where God comes as a baby, comes in the flesh to, his, to the creation and then gives him his life for and then raises from the dead they're, they're, it's unheard of. It doesn't exist anywhere. Every other faith system is all about me, 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 me. What can I do? What do I have to do? When do I have to do it? How many times do I have to do it? There is no other belief system that has God coming to bring redemption for his people. And this was a boy born as a baby so that when we approach the throne of grace, we know that this is someone who's walked our walk felt our pain, is completely relatable. And at the same time, he's a son. The son is his deity that no human could ever make intercession for us. But God could. And so in this, this idea of God wrapped in the flesh is just, you can, volumes and volumes and volumes are written on it. But I wanted to tell you why it's important said here. Because he wants us to understand this is not just an ordinary child, and it wasn't just some epiphany, some, some mist, some idea, ideology, some belief system. It was a man, the God-man. And then he gives, then he gives these, these character attributes. He begins with wonderful counselor. When I think of the word wonderful, I think of the word wow. Wow, when it's not a fake word, when wow is not just something I say wow, it's always something that gets elicited from something else when I say wow legitimately, Right? When you say, wow, something else has elicited, wow. So it's beyond expectation. It caught you off guard. It was bigger than you thought, smaller than you thought, whatever. But it's, wow. So it's an adjective. But it's, what's interesting to me is the first character trait listed here in Isaiah is, wow, what a counselor. What did, what did Ahaz need the most when he was surveying the, the future of his city? He needed good counsel. At this day and time, we have everything at our fingertips and see all the information we hear. We, we don't even have it at our fingertips. We have it by voice command, right? What's, our, what's the voice command to get information? Hey, Siri. hey, Siri, do I need Jesus? I really couldn't say. Most important question I think you could ever ask anybody. Siri, he, you know, I, I made it a man's voice, <laughs> if you notice. So, I mean, just for years and years, I just... 
this female voice kept, voice kept telling me where to go and what to do, and I just decided to flip the script. <laughs> All right, let me get, let me, uh, uh, no, no, I'm already in enough trouble. In the cacophony of noise, what we don't need is more information. What we need is wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to see beneath, beyond, behind, all the information all the circumstances, and have an accurate, profitable, life-giving approach. We need wisdom. And it's the first character trait that Isaiah lists, a wow counselor. Many times we'll go to people and ask their advice, and we already know what they're going to say. We actually choose them because we know who's going to agree with us. That's not counsel. That's fluff. That's tr- that gets your courage up on something that's weak and flimsy. What you want is you want someone to speak the truth in love. Because the truth is the only thing that sets us free. And the love is the only thing that nurtures our heart. You can be loving and not tell me the truth, and you aren't loving. You can be truthful and not loving, and all you're going to do is open a new wound. God speaks to us truth and love. Wonderful counselor. Mighty God. The Hebrew is God's mighty warrior. God's mighty warrior. Wow counselor. Strength that we can't even imagine. And that strength wrapped up in a child. Once again, once again, demonstrating that God continues to wow people through small things. That Israel misses the Messiah because they wait, they're wanting a coronated king. Well, the God was a baby in a trough. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, everlasting, never had a beginning, never had an ending. Father, this is sometimes a big hurdle for some folks coming to Christ when, when there is um, when there's difficulty or has, when there's been hurt and pain by your father. And I can understand that. And, but God doesn't use this, this, um, this description of father to draw up negative images from our childhood for those that have them, but to draw the contrast to what a true father is. When I think about father, I think about identity. You know, I, I look just like my dad. I look, and the older I get, I look more and more like my dad. I act just like my mom. But I look just like my dad. There's an identity to that. When I think of father, I think of, um, of uh, protection. That, that when, when, you know, my dad can beat up your dad kind of protection. The, the, if it breaks, my dad can fix it. Protect. You know, you remember the first time maybe your father couldn't fix something that you broke? You know, like, like what happened to my dad, right? So I think, I think, of, I think of protection. I think of provision, and he says these are everlasting, never had a beginning, never had an ending. All of it's in the middle with us. Identity, provision, protection, everlasting father. And then he ends with the prince of peace. Um, not someone that, you know, just brings peace. Someone who is peace. Someone who is the ruler of peace. Like he controls peace. He's the one who tells peace where to go. He's the ruler of peace. And he is peace. That's some great characteristics. And then my favorite part, though, is when I look at this, is, is a lost, maybe a lost word. Just like nevertheless you can run by, there's a word in the last verse that it's easy to run by when it talks about the zeal of the Lord. Here's the verse. Let's finish out the text with this. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. And it says, the zeal of of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Now, in danger of losing you one more time, <laughs> I saw my favorite commercial for progressive insurance um, on TV the other night. And it's, it's, they've run it now for a couple years, but it's when Flo comes in the house to talk to her sister. Her sister just bought a house, and she's on this uh, 
stationary bike. You know what it kind of, And so at one point in there, she says, the, the, her, his sister says, her sister says, um, stop it. Passion, cycling is my passion. So if you know the, me and Courtney, I'll stand over here, Courtney. So, and, and so, right, what a funny commercial. It, it, it's funny. And, and I try not to lose you, and you took me, you took me seriously. <laughs> um, zeal, see, every other faith system has me having to accomplish something. That it has to originate with me. And all of this, the promise of nevertheless, the character of the promise, is all provided by God. It's his passion. His passion is on display from the first time he says, Adam, where are you in the garden? When Adam had sinned and him and Eve were hiding. Adam, where are you? God knew where they were. What is he doing? It's his passion to redeem his people that pursue his people. It is his zeal that does this. His passion. Most recognized of scriptures is John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. That is his pursuit of that he was the first giver. And the motivation of the gift comes from God, not from me. For God so loved. Probably the verse that is least quoted and least recognized would be the one that follows in the shadow of 316, and it's 317. It says, for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Satan launches an anti-God campaign in the book of Genesis. He launches the campaign with this lie. God's not enough. God's not enough, Adam. Eve, God's not enough. He's holding out on you. There's more in this garden for you And you need to trust me and not trust God. And then even in our culture today, we fall into this this idea that, that God is the one who is this cosmic punisher waiting for us to step out of line. And so we don't want to comply to that kind of force and pressure, so we keep him off to the side. But yet... In a previous, uh, previous passage I read to you, it says that, that for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders. And, 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 and what, what, what the indication here is, is that we ride on God. God doesn't ride on us. When Annie was little, uh, I'd, I'd give her rides on my shoulders. It was some of the fun things we did. We did sometimes just for fun, just to laugh. I'd grab her little feet. We'd bounce around all over the place. Sometimes, sometimes I did it because she was tired. We were going somewhere, doing something. She got tired, and instead of carrying her this way or piggyback when she couldn't wrap her, I put her on my shoulders. Sometimes I did it because she needed to see, I wanted her to see something she couldn't see at two feet, but she could see at eight feet. Put on her shoulders. God doesn't condemn us. His intent was to, to love us and for us to rest on his shoulders, sometimes for fun. Sometimes for the joy of kicking around a park with my dad. And sometimes because life's just got a little bit more energy than I do right now. And sometimes because he wanted to show me something, I couldn't see where I was. The lies, every lie the enemy has ever told me come from the roots of God's not enough and I'm not enough. And I'd venture to say that every lie you've ever heard comes from the very same two roots. And Isaiah tells us 
a century or more before Jesus is born, that God is enough. And where you and I aren't enough, he makes us enough. He determined that nevertheless of where we were or where we even are, he would make us enough. Promise of hope. The provision of hope, the motivation of hope is Christ. It's Christ. God's own power. And I, when I go through, when I write a message and I begin praying about it, I, I try to think, can I pray along these lines? Lord, who's, who's going to be in the room? Who might be in the room? Now, I'm, I'm not thinking about individuals by name. I'm, I'm thinking about where people's hearts may be. One person or group of people today might be in the, you're in the pursuit phase of God, just trying to figure out is, is he really real and does it really matter? The reason why I would say you're in the pursuit phase is you wouldn't be here or you wouldn't be watching right now online. Something has drawn you. To you, I would say he's everything and more than ever dreamed. He does all the heavy lifting for us on the cross. The doing part is not on us, it's on him. But the yielding and surrendering part, that's ours. That's the one we carry. I spoke to someone right after the first service and they came to speak to me and, and they're in pursuit. And, and I believe actually even made a decision today for Christ, but their question was, I don't know how to change all these things. And I said, sweetie, that's where, that's where everybody else tells you. That's what the enemy tells you. It's, a, we, it's, not, we don't, it's not stuff we change. It's the stuff he changes. I, I yield, he transforms. I don't clean up. I, don't, I, don't, I can't clean up enough for him, but I can yield enough to him. I can surrender enough to him. And when I do that, listen, for type A driven folks, it'd be easier if we put some kind of requirement on it or some kind of dollar amount on it, and then people would say, okay, I'll do that because it rests on them. But yet, Christ said, I've done it all. But you need to yield. There may be some today that this is the time to not just maybe see the light, but to settle in the dawn of the light. Another group I thought about would be, though you're just overwhelmed already. Season might not have anything to do with it. You're just overwhelmed. The message today for you is, for unto us a child is born and a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. And I want to encourage you that if you're staying on his shoulders, it's going to be okay. Because he's, he's with you. And maybe I didn't even get to this part of the message, but you've gotten off his shoulders. You've hit, you've hit time out. You've hit pause. Something's happened something you can't explain, something that's rocked your world, and you've just said, you know, I just, I just, yeah, I'm going to have to call time out now. And you've climbed off the shoulders of Christ, and you're trying to figure it out on your own or do it on your own. And my prayer today was that you would recognize that it's only on his shoulders where there's refreshment and joy and insight, strength, and that you take the time out away and you hit the play button again. You get back in the game. You get back in the game. You climb back on his shoulders. Let's take a moment and pray. Lord, you, you know exactly who's in this room. You know exactly who's watching online. Lord, you know exactly who will watch this three months from now. And Lord, I trust you that you've used this small thing, me, to do a big thing in someone's life. Lord, your word carries that kind of weight and power. And so I pray now for those in the room, Lord, that their trust would turn to you, not their ability to figure something out, not their ability to make something work, not, not an ability to pull enough resources or people together. Lord, their, their trust, they would rely on you. Lord, that the lies of the enemy 
that you're not enough and they're not enough will be broken today, that we are known and loved by you, that you comprehensively know us and completely love us. But the word nevertheless is a real word. I believe some of your hearts are pounding and maybe you're even trying to pray yourself. Maybe you don't know what to do or how to do it. But if you don't know Jesus, and by that I mean you've never surrendered your life to him and let him take the reins, take control, take leadership to to wash away the sin that separates you from him. I believe today's your day. He's done all the heavy lifting. We do the yielding. And it's just an offering yourself to him. I believe there's some that you've, you're, in a, you're in a period of being so overwhelmed and you needed to be right, reminded today that you have a wonderful counselor and you have a mighty God and you have an everlasting father and you have a prince of peace. And I want you to leave today being reminded of that and that you would rest in that. And then there's the third group. You'd recognize that maybe, maybe you couldn't put it into words until this morning when I said you've hit time out, you've hit pause on God. And this is God's call to you to get back up on his shoulders. And before I pray a concluding prayer, if any of those, or maybe something I didn't touch on, but God's working on you right now, will you just raise your hand so I can see? Just raise your hand if this is a, I'm coming back to you, Lord, or I'm going to get back up on your shoulders. I, I need to not hit pause. God bless you. Father, you, the, the motion that it took even to raise a hand, Lord, is a, is a confession to you. It's a surrender to you. And Lord, I pray that, Lord, that the burden that they even feel would be lifted in the name of Jesus and that your hope would reside where fear once lived. In the name of Jesus, we